of the youngest son, Lee. And as you're working your way through the parable and you get down toward the end, ask your set, uh, the second question, you ask yourself, why was the oldest son really angry? And how did it affect him? And we'll look at some things because they fit us very well as a society of wild ones. Things to consider as we're looking at this is this is a farm situation as Jesus paints the picture. So let's read verse 11 down to the end of the chapter if you'll permit me with this lengthy reading. So then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to him his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Pause for just a second. Now time has got to have elapsed for this to have taken place. Meanwhile, dad and the oldest son, and possibly some servants who were working along with him, are back at the farm, and eventually, through time, they hear about what the youngest son's done with the money that he was given. And so as you're following along with the story, I want you to see what's happening. So quite a bit of time's probably elapsed, according to the parable here, for all of this to have taken place. Where are they working? A farm. A farm runs good when everyone pulls his weight. We've got the oldest son that's out there, night and day, working and doing what he normally does, and his younger brother along with him. And then one day, all of a sudden, he not only gets his share of the inheritance early, but he takes and he leaves them. Regardless of what he's done or what he's even heard about, all he knows at that point is, I'm left to do everything. Dad's now relying on me to take up the slack of my younger brother who wouldn't live up, and you can imagine how the older brother syndrome comes along. He never pulled his weight anyway. I was always having to pick up behind him and do all this. And all this is feeding his mind as he's thinking about this son who's now left him with everything to do. Either it's by himself or to manage his servants, but either way, he's having to get up extra early and stay out extra late to get everything done. Now, once you see that, think about that as you're looking at the parable. So the word comes back that he's gone off to this far land and he's, lived, he's wasted his, term, his possessions in prodigal living. Verse 14. Now, back to the younger son. When he spent all, there rose a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in want. Of course, he used up all his money. Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him off into the fields to feed the swine. Jewish people are hearing this. By the way, you back up at the beginning of the parable, and there's a setting of who are there listening to this. Verse 1 says there are tax collectors and sinners who drew near to hear what was going on. Verse 2 then talks about the Pharisees and the scribes are also on hand. Not particularly necessarily to learn from Jesus, but to see what he's up to. So he's amassed a good variety of people of religious backgrounds, of leaders and of poor people all along. And Jesus is telling this parable. Now as you're looking at what's going on and you're seeing this as a Jewish background and you see this guy is off taking care of pigs. Jewish people don't touch pigs. Jewish people don't eat pork. It's an anathema for them to even consider doing that, and especially to be caring for them. This is all that this guy can find to do. He's disgraced his family in every way possible. He's taken his livelihood early. He's walked off the job, and then he's gone off and done some stuff that he shouldn't have done, morally speaking. He's wasted everything, and now on top of that, number four, he's out with the pigs. Older brother saying, I can't believe this. Of course, you might know. That's the way the other brother always was. And again, feeding his mind, as we do, human beings, in the middle of this story. Verse 16. This is his condition. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with pods 
that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and before you, rather, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. He saw him, and he had compassion, and he ran, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But, but the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. And they began to be married. Now the older son, second part of the parable, the older son was out in the field, like he'd always been, day in and day out, early in the morning, thinking about where the brother had been and what he's done. He was out in the field. And as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him, what do these things mean? And he said, that your, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and son, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. And he would not go in. Therefore his father came out and he pleaded with him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured, devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. Just doesn't make sense. And the father said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. There are many roads to the wilderness. Two sons show two paths. But if you look at the New Testament, there's not just two types of people described. But rather, these two represent, I think, a variety of different people. Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes in a letter to the people of Galatians in a very pagan area. He says in verse 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary to one another. Verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Listen to the variety of paths to the wilderness, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. The list goes on, in other words. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Path to the wilderness. Society is overflowing with wildness. Choosing their own paths to go on. These two represent, these two sons, two different paths, of many of which take us to the wilderness. 
Let's look for a moment at what all of God's wild ones really need as we think about ourselves. This is a <coughs> parable told to God's people, both to the religious leaders and to the people of the world, you might say. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. What the wild ones need, number one, is to come to themselves. Here's this young son. He's out watching what's going on. And then the Bible says, and he came to himself. It was almost like there's part of him over here, and there's another part on the other side. And then all of a sudden, the two finally come together. You get that? He came to himself. We use the term quite often, he's not in his right mind. It's like the mind is over here and the behavior is over there. Or he's out of his mind. As if parts over here and another parts over there. And it's not functioning properly. It's not working right. And it's not going to happen good for him. Matter of fact, they even, those who talk to Paul, some of the religious, or the, the rather the kings of their time, when he was talking about the resurrection, and the king said to Paul, you're, you're out of your mind, Paul with your many studies. You see the idea? He came to himself. The two came together. And together is what God intends for us to do. Under his guidance, you see. That we function in our right mind. To, in order for this person to realize that he was on a wild path, he had to come to himself. Do you need to come to yourself? To realize the path you've been walking. And ask yourself, what is it going to take? How many wake-up calls does it take? I remember hearing a preacher speak some time ago. And he's talking about his old life. And he said, God came along and he tapped me with a hammer. He said, I didn't listen. So God got a bigger hammer. He said, I still didn't listen. He said, then he pulled out the sledgehammer. I don't remember what happened in his life. But he was getting to the idea that I came to myself. We need to come to ourselves. To get anywhere, to be where God wants us to be. Because the mind's in one side, the behavior's over here. God's trying to direct everything, but we're not together. Get it together. Come to yourself. If you have the proper perspective, you can make good decisions, which we'll see in a second. But I want you to notice also that the older son didn't come to himself. He got up early and worked hard. He, the alarm clock wasn't his friend. He beat the alarm clock up every day. It might go off three hours after he's out in the field because he's out early doing everything the father wanted. Came back at the end of the day, but he missed an understanding of family and relationships. He didn't come to himself over that issue. As we talked about from Galatians passage, there's, there's all kinds of things that separate us from God. Come to yourself lest you miss out on the greatest opportunity of celebration. Number two, realize that the Father's servants eat better than the pigs do. As the young man was analyzing the situation, verse 16, it says, And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him any. And then he realized that the servants... Yeah, they were servants. They ate bread, but they had bread left over. They're doing better than I am, and I'm not doing as good as the pigs are. The father's servants eat better than the pigs. Matter of fact, if it takes it, God will put you there where the pigs are out eating you. Which is exactly where this young man was. If you look at it. I hear people talk so well, he wound up eating, the, eating what the pigs were eating. No, he, he wished, if you read it carefully, he wished he could have had what the pigs were eating. He desired that. But he didn't even have that. 
And it dawned on him that the pigs are out eating me. Something's not right. So he realized that the father was doing better with his servants. Number three, his decision to arise, verses 18 and 19. After he came to himself and he realized what was going on, he says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. I'm getting up. It's time for me to get going. God calls for soldiers of Christ to arise and put their armor on. He's not looking for people to observe what's going on in the kingdom. He's looking for soldiers to fight in the kingdom. Amen. Soldiers of Christ arise. Joshua 24. As Joshua is closing out his career of having leading God's people for a long time after Moses had died, and even during that time underneath Moses, he was a victorious warrior. Now he's had this great victory, and he looks back at his people, God's people, and he sees their heart and how they're looking at still some of the things that they used to do and the, the pagan idolatry, and he says, okay, this is the day. Choose who you're going to serve. And he painted the pictures. You can go back to the gods of the Amorites and all this, but, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. There's a choice and a decision that needs to be made. Arise and get at it. And you see, that was the thing that this guy did. He not only realized what was going on, but he got up and he did something about it. How too often we see what's happening and we won't get up and do anything. An old dear friend of mine who's still preaching to this day started working under him in the 1970s. He said, the road to the bad place is paved with a lot of good intentions. I'm going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. And we keep telling ourselves this day or that day, I, I'm, I'm going to go. But you see in this whole process, number four, this young man had the commitment to follow through. He says, I will arise and go to my father. And then he gets up and he does it. How many times have we thought, tomorrow I'm going to start new. Or tonight or today. And we, and we get in the position, that, oh, maybe the next day. And we cut ourselves so much slack. God will let you eat with the pigs if you want to. If that's what it takes. Or wish you had what the pigs had. As in this case. But he wants you home. And he'll let happen whatever to get you there. To not only get you to arise to the decision, but to follow through with the commitment. He wants you. He wants you so bad that he sent his son to die for you. That's how desperate God was on this. Jesus tells a story, or actually a story that unfolds in Matthew 19. Where a young man comes to Jesus... And he asks, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. And this young man says, I've done it all. Ever since I was a young kid, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he's saying. I've done it all. And he names the different things. I've not done this and I've not done that like the rest of the world. I'm living this way. And Jesus says, good. One more thing, by the way. Just take what you got and go sell it. And then come follow me. And Matthew says, verse 22, he went away sorrowful. He came to himself. He saw what he needed to do. He got up and he went to Jesus and he wanted to know. But when he got to the point of following through, he turned around and went home. He couldn't bite that bullet of commitment. Couldn't swallow it. And he left. And to this day, he's kicking himself. On the other side of eternity, Thinking all of those riches that he had, was it really worth it? The follow through is so important. Jesus is telling us this in all through the New Testament. At the end of the book of Revelation, it says, Be faithful unto death. Now, not halfway through, God wants his servants with him at the end. Follow through is so important in understanding what God wants us to do. <coughs> Wild ones need to know. They need to come to themselves. 
You need to realize that the father's servants eat better than the pigs. You need to have a decision to arise and then a commitment to follow through. And then number five, you need to understand that we are made to belong together. And this is where the oldest son missed out. Go back and look at what's going on here. I want you to, to read what happens in here. This discussion. Verse 25, the older son was out in the field. He came and he drew himself near the house. He heard the music. Asked the servants, what's going on? What does this mean? Verse 26. Verse 27, he says, your brother's come home. Father's killed a fatted calf. Verse 28. But he was angry. How many years he'd been working? Picking up the slack for that bummer young brother he had. He wasted everything. Lived a terrible life. Now he comes home and he's mad. But that's part of the point of this parable. Verse 30. This older son looks at the father and he says, As soon as, notice the phrase, this son of yours came. Father back in verse 32 says, Your brother. But the brother says, Your son. We joke about that once in a while. Back when the kids were at home, I'd come in, maybe I'd been out a long time or whatever, and they'd been at the house for quite a while, I'd come in, and they would say, guess what your daughter did today? <coughs> no, it's not good when it starts out with your daughter. Never was anything bad. But it was mine all of a sudden, because whatever she did wasn't good enough that she wanted to claim her. That's funny, but this is not. Jesus is telling it like it is. The older brother comes up and says, this son of yours, I'm not claiming ownership anymore. I don't belong to him. You see what he's made me do? And Jesus tells the parable, he wraps up and he says, but it is right to celebrate. Your brother is home. We are made to be together. We don't function separate. We don't live a life of independence from one another. When you look at the passage in Ephesians chapter 2 about what Paul is telling the, the church there, it's so interesting. I want you to turn there just for a moment and see what's being said. Because he tells us about what we have been given as Christians. Starting at verse 1, he says, You have been made alive when you were dead in your trespasses. This is what God has done for you as individual people. Understand that. Maybe you weren't living the life like I was back when I was 21. Because I knew it all and there wasn't anybody going to tell me what to do. And it was a mean, tough life. And only by the grace of God am I not dead today or in prison. Made alive by God. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You know, he could have omitted that word together, and you're going to see it three or four times in it. It would have made the same importance. He could have just said he made us alive. But he says together in there. That in exceeding uh, ages to come, he might show the, the great riches of, of his grace and the kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But there's this verse 6 that I jumped over intentionally. Verse 5, he made us alive together, raised us up together, makes us sit together. He could have said all that without the together. There have been the same thing. But he's together, together, together. So the father comes to the son, the oldest son, he says, you need to be inside with your brother. We need to be together. Son was too mad. Couldn't take it. Walked out. And he missed. There are many roads to the wilderness. Lots of paths. And we all look at one another too often. 
and see how everybody else is doing, and we make our judgments by what they're doing. And I don't want to be like that. I'm not going to join with them. We are made to be together. We are forgiven together. We are raised up together. The parable is told to God's people that understand that God wants us home. And He wants us together. And we, as a part of the society, got to be careful that we don't get influenced. Decisions. Time to stand and rise up. Time to follow through. Time to know who you are. And that we belong together. Maybe you've been missing it. But that's what Jesus is telling us. And I think he's the one in charge, is he not? Are you a Christian today? God wants you home. Are you living for him? Have you made the decision and are you following through? And if not, come today when we stand and sing.